Good evening, welcome to Vaughn Marx Presents Marx Said You About Nothing. Marx Said You About Nothing. Marx Said You About Nothing. Where we apply the revolutionary Marx scale to classic and contemporary literature. Marx Said You About Nothing. Marx Said You About Nothing. This podcast contains mature content, spoilers, language, you have been warned. Hello and welcome back to Mots to Do About Nothing. I am Steve Ormosi or Steve and I am joined today by Rich Perry. How are you doing? Ian Manzer. I just want to point that out that you're looking at your notebook what before you said our names. So <laughs> <laughs> And Scott Thurlow. <laughs> he wrote it down correctly. Oh, hello again. It was great as he started off by looking to see what his name was. <laughs> today So many names. Today we are going to be talking about the short story, An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, by Ambrose Bierce, uh, written in 1890, mm-hmm. shortly after the Civil War. And uh, I'm actually going to give the logline, the funny logline, uh, which I have written down and I am going to read. <laughs> Uh, and I probably didn't need to. Yeah. Can't What's remember- so civil about Civil War? <laughs> <laughs> oh. you, can't, you can't remember that simple phrase. <laughs> anyway. And we're going to kick it to Ian for the intro body conclusion. Uh, I'm sorry. We're going to kick it to Scott for the intro body conclusion. Uh, yes, that is true. So uh, if anyone has never heard of this story, it's a very famous story and f- for a very good reason. Uh, it's sort of the er example of a certain kind of story, a certain kind of narrative that you've seen many, many times done variously since it's been written. Um, so basically, a Confederate soldier is about, to, or Confederate sympathizer, really, even, is about to be hanged by uh, northern uh, troops off the uh, the middle of a, a old railroad bridge, and he's they're preparing to do like the um, the military motiv- uh, motions, if you will. He uh, is dropped through and. The story tells us that he, uh, the the rope breaks. He falls through the bridge. He has a big like swimming escape. Uh, he's getting shot at, etc. He, he goes through an, a number of uh, tribulations. Gets back to land. Gets back to his family, home, his wife that he's so de- he's, he's dying and he he's he's he's, he's clawing on to, to make it there and he makes it ho- he makes it home. But of course, it's all a dying dream. And the last scene is him his neck snapping <laughs> off the bridge. It's mm-hmm. very, very famous uh, for that very reason, and it's it's a very short story, maybe the 12, 14 pages at, at max, and like I said, uh, it's it's going to get a lot of credit for what it did because it's one of the earliest examples, uh, because it's so concise and so well done, and you've seen the dying dream thing, if you will, so many times since, but this is the one that started it all, so that's pretty much what happens, and I'm going to give it a three because I've seen so many adaptations of it. Whoa! Right out of the gate. Yes. All right. I mean, right. I don't see how you can't, but you can convince I, me otherwise. I'm gonna. I'm gonna, I'm I'm gonna go- tell you how I can. I'm okay. gonna. I'm going to agree with you, but Rich may have something to say okay. about that. However, what I would like to say before any of that happens is not only is it the or example, as you might say, for the um, that that kind of that specific type of twist mm-hmm. where it was all a dream, but it's also one of the original examples of the unreliable narrator. Yep, true. Sure. Um, which is kind of a brilliant thing. And one of my favorite things uh, when done well in, in literature. Oh, of course, I agree. Um, the intro body conclusion, the whole story, uh, done very well and done in three parts yep. in this very, mm-hmm. very clearly laid out for you as cut well. Cut up, but into three. Very non sequential parts. Well, that's actually, which is, I think, what Ian's going to talk about. I'll, uh, I'll this is also one of the first uh, use of nonlinear storytelling, mm-hmm. where it, it, it tells the present day of his execution and it goes into the past and then uh, returns to the uh, present or the dying dream, if you will. But, like, again, it, it, this was such a forerunner of a lot of uh, tropes and exa- uh, different types of uh, narrative storytelling that we take for granted. Uh, exactly. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, one of the forerunners of, uh, I think as you mentioned earlier, uh, before the podcast, Ian, uh, one of the forerunners of Quentin Tarantino's style of story. Jumping around right? in the narrative, sure. Uh, in, in fact, every time I watch a Tarantino film, I'm going to You're expecting somebody to be Ambrose hanging Beast by the end of the movie, yeah. Yeah. right? Sure. Rich, yeah. <laughs> let, tell me a story about uh, why you're not giving this a three. Well, I, I don't want to say that I'm not going to give it a three. <laughs> All right. But like I... Had, my original reasoning for not giving it a three is because I had seen quite a few stories that have done this better. But then, like you guys had mentioned, because it illuminated that uh, this was a precursor to so many, mm. which I have to give it, I have to grade on a curve pretty much. Mm. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. if this no, is, fair. as far as far as like this being the first story to ever do this, it was definitely a valiant effort. Mm-hmm. Like the, uh, the non-sequential storytelling was a little clunky for me. Like the flashbacks seemed a little out of place. I feel like sure. it could have been set up better. I get yeah. it. But it, was, it still worked. It still worked. It had kind of not too much of a bearing on it in the sense that, well, looking at it, looking at the story, like it had not too much, it didn't have too much of a bearing on it. Except to set up the fa- or to set up why he assumed that he was going that if he could make a break for the bank, he would have made it to freedom. I like that he I, I like that he took the time to tell why he came to that conclusion. But no, what's interesting, and this is a I, I mentioned to you precast. I want to ask a question about this story, and it specifically deals with that second uh, part of um, the, the the reflection upon why he did this. Um, was the person who told him about the bridge actually a, a a forward scout for the Union Army, or is he trying to, like, as an, he's an unreliable narrator, and it's demonstrated in this section, is he saying like trying to find an excuse for like is this his justification for why well, he got caught? S- if, you, if you allow me to speak quickly, because sure. and before you go, um, a couple of things that you guys just mentioned, I never actually thought of it, but at least in in terms of that deeply. But uh, let's be clear, it's yes, it's unreliable narration, but it's an unreliable narrator because it's not in first person, mm, right? right? So it's being described to you as if it were in third. Yeah, but you hear his inner monologue, let's sure, say. Sure, sure. So, um, and I just want to also touch on something like, we. this has come up before in various episodes that we've done where one of us might not be aware of like an earlier iteration of something. So therefore, it seems lesser in our eyes because we've never experienced it, but you've seen so many things that, sure, did it better. But that stuff had to have come from somewhere. Right. So to answer your question about uh, at least the uh, the supposed scout who gives him information, I always took it as indeed like at face value. But in the light of it possibly not being, sure, it might add something. I, I like that interpretation. I would like to I, – I, if you're going to say something, Ian, I just want to jump in here. Um, you, The question you posed was, was it perhaps a forward union scout? Well, and it, the narrator – or not the narrator, but the main character, uh, Peyton Farquaad, ripped off from Shrek, obviously. Sure. <laughs> was was a was from the South. So you might have you you might have met a Confederate scout. No, I when think, you said that, I think but, in but the story itself it says that the guy is a spy. Is a spy. I didn't. I didn't pick. I didn't that catch up. that. Ad either. I didn't pick that up. But maybe, up maybe either. it did. Maybe it did say that. Um, and that might have been just something that I missed. But I think that's an interesting line of thinking. Like in that, this person was a spy. But as far as the narrative went, um, it seemed like everything was going fairly well until something went wrong for this. But like, it was. T- it's tough to tell because it's such a short part of the narrative that he talks about uh, yeah, like actually never, trying to they, pull this off, right? Do he doesn't actually even talk about trying to pull it off. No. He just says that it, it's basically just like a, a small hope. Right. Yeah, that's what he's, he basically says, uh, what <laughs> he's basically like, 
Well, what would happen if <laughs> yeah. somebody were somebody to, yeah. were to go and like sure. do not this, necessarily and were, me and they, <laughs> and they were like and and whoever it was I'm was not saying to I'm going to blow up the bridge basically but. said like you can you could definitely get there and he was like hmm was interesting like, the, the way that and then they, he was about to yeah, be hanged the way that the way that story happened like I just imagined him like turning to the Nazis in camera and just like giving one of these <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly uh, uh, may I just read a quote from yeah, you that? Get, get sure, the line go for it. Uh, the lady had now brought the water which the soldier drank. He thanked her ceremoniously, bowed to her husband, and rode away. An hour later, after nightfall, he, re- he repassed the plantation, going northward in the direction from which he had come. He was a federal scout. Oh. Hmm. Missed that. So very well, nice. Well, that was a very obvious statement that I missed. <laughs> yeah, I just, it just kind of went by me. And the, my argument is that it's actually the interpretation you have that it wasn't a federal scout, that he had – was trying to find an excuse for why he got caught. I mean, and, right. and earlier on, he says that he couldn't have been a Confederate soldier, but he's not going to get into that. So you, yeah, you get yeah. a lot of, like, in a sense, him making excuses. But I'm just trying to no, draw no, I, more I, out of the story. I'm, so that, than, that I'm very actually, glad that you brought that up. I did. I yeah. missed that part, yep. and that's a very important part of the so story. It, that it, I, bother, it that bothered me a little bit that they didn't really give too much information on why he was being hanged, but then I think it made the story stronger I think, to yeah, have it be... But I also think I think ambiguous. it was I think it was obvious why he was being hanged by you know insinuating what he was going to do from the earlier part. Mm-hmm. And I sure. I kind of like that they left that part uh, that that Amber Pierce left that part out. Like it didn't need to be said. You knew why he was getting hanged, right? Like I, I don't think there was any I don't think there was any real like question. He obviously tried to go and burn down that bridge mm-hmm. and that's why he was on that hangman's noose, you know? I don't disagree. And uh, in fact, yeah, I, that's really excellent that you pointed out because I didn't really, like, it sort of, like, went over my head. Like, it just went in and out, if you will. But you're right. Because of the nature of the story, it could be that he was obviously a federal scout because we only have what the narration <laughs> well, tells it does, us. It does say that, apparently. Right. But because it's a flashback, right, because it's, again, framed in unreliable narrator, we can sort of rabbit hole ourselves. Yeah, I don't that's want, true. I don't want, like, we shouldn't. It's, it's, sort of, it's sort of the opposite. It'd be, it'd be great if that was, like, a realization the main character came to as he was being hanged it's like yeah. well shit yeah so he was a, you could have <laughs> that i'm saying you could have that intervention too i'm just saying it lent itself to various like a number of them yeah. but i don't yeah. like it's almost, it's almost the opposite of it's neither here nor there it's an important detail but because you don't know the truth you can never mm-hmm. actually be sure yeah. well let's let's say let's let's lay this to rest because i think this is going to come up again in yeah. dialogue and again in style probably a little bit uh, so let's lay the intro body conclusion to rest. I'm gonna give it a three. Three for me. Three for me. Three. Three's all around. All right. All right. Sounds good. Uh, and that's gonna bring it to me with themes. Um, obviously this is a Civil War story, and it's it's got a lot of like roots in. <sighs> It, or not, it doesn't have – it is the roots of a lot of <laughs> other types of stories, yes. which I think is really interesting. And I, and, and I think that some of those themes come through. But it's, it's this idea of like trying to get home again a lot and like and, – and also the things that you think about right before you die, right? Sure. Um, which is interesting. I don't know if it um, is – truth right but like a lot of things have borrowed from this like your whole life flashes sure, before absolutely. your eyes before right. you die right. like the things that are important to you come to you before you die and i think that this explores all those things very neatly and succinctly um and i think it does a good job with that i, I don't know what you guys say. I, I would love to hear what you guys think so i'm gonna say that this is a study in heroism mm. and that you have a I character lord farquaad <laughs> who <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is so desperate to be a hero. He, for whatever reason, did not partake in the Civil War. He couldn't be a soldier. Uh, he wants the glory, the recognition, to do his part. Oh. He's taken away. And the hero story we see is him escaping from this tragic fate, mm. right. which is a, a entire illusion, a manufactured lie he tells himself to like justify his death in a way. And to... And, and to- I think take the pain away from yes. his death. Right? Both of he those is, at once. He never, in a, way, in a way, to bring up Joseph Campbell here, he senses uh, the call to adventure, but 
fails to <laughs> sure. like, achieve he, he it. Never yeah. gets, he never no, it was, gets it was never given but to he, him. But he does get the uh, what's the, the escape or whatever. The magic flight. Yeah, yeah. He does get the magic flight. Which is the most magic of all because it doesn't actually exist. <laughs> yes. Sure. Uh, it's actually a really tragic story about uh, a man who fought a losing war in a way like the civil war in general. Yeah. Like, Tried and failed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, that's what I'm going to say. Like, I think that's the most obvious theme, or at least one of the, that, yeah, that the fruitlessness and the tragedy of war, especially given in light of the war it was written about, i.e. the Civil War, sure, I think it's all definitely contained therein. But again, I think it's, uh, maybe we'll discuss this sort of entangled with with style maybe a bit. But nevertheless, that, yeah, the the vision that comes to you at your death, whatever it may be, it explores that. And I think it does a good job of portraying it, even if that's not actually what truly happens. I guess we'll never know until we're at that point ourselves. And and a very interesting thing, I think, is that Ambrose Bierce himself, the writer, was a Union soldier. Right? Yep. So th- I think uh, an, an exterior theme, perhaps, is him trying to explore the mindset of somebody on, on the, the other side, side sure. of, the, of the war, which is... Um, I think a very human way to do it, a very human thing to do, especially 30 years after the war ended, sure, or I don't, 25 years after the war ended. I don't ended. disagree. And, like, he's trying to figure out what it all was about and, like, what, what it was, you know, he, he's, he's... Civil War, bringing, what, is it, what is it good for? He's interestingly bringing humanity back into uh probably a side that he had to dehumanize to a certain extent mm-hmm. when he was fighting against them right? absolutely sure and i think to your point the when the representation of the union soldiers they're in a sense automatons in a way they're just they're going through the motions yeah, right. exactly. soldiers yeah um so he doesn't glorify the union at all no uh he just it's a tragedy for confederate and it's an interesting he doesn't even like, describe them as human yeah. really yeah. everyone just loses products of their uh yeah. Their station. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think yeah. that that's, all that stuff is strong enough collectively, and some of it maybe individually even, uh, to, give, to, like to give it a more. I just noticed now, he never really blames them for what happened. No, he knows. He, he's like, I got caught, and this is what happens in war. Mm-hmm. Essentially, like, that's basically in between the lines, more or less. So, I, I'm going to give themes of one, is all I'm saying. Yeah, I, 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 I'm going to give it a strong, strong one, one yeah. actually. I, I really liked where this went, and, and I never really wavered in that. Mm-hmm. One. Uh, the more we have this conversation, the stronger the one gets, became. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I agree. So. I agree. All right. So uh, we're going to go to antagonist with Rich. So uh, are we going with the abstract and the antagonist being war? Yes. We're going with whatever you want. I was going to go with that, obviously. <laughs> it's, it's been a, it seems like recently it's been a frequent occurrence with us, yeah. but I, I don't see how you can't call at least part of it that. So go on. Yeah. Like the, like he's just a, he's a product of what's happening and he like as soon as he got the chance to i guess live out his dreams of becoming the important soldier mm-hmm. trying to live up to the ideals that they've been peddling for this battle that's been going on he jumped at the chance and mm-hmm. fell short yeah <laughs> no no exactly like it's, <laughs> like it's, it's tragic for sure but i mean that's pretty much like a poor man's evil Knievel. <laughs> <laughs> he fell onto the bus <laughs> of hey, war he, he got paid for the attempt yeah got his hit payment by, was a rope around the neck he got yeah. hit by the bus of the civil war so like yeah i mean uh, you know fans and audiences and you guys know that i'm a proponent of choosing an abstract like thing but I, I think you can't escape it in this story. Well, it's, it's impossible to escape it. Right, yeah. sure, like just the, like the end of his uh, noose. I- exactly, <laughs> it is inevitably there. And yeah, the 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 northern the federal soldiers like automatons essentially. Like they might as well have been mm-hmm. right. But I think that's an aspect of the dehumanization factor that you were right. saying, for sure. So uh, I'm going to give it a strong one on both fronts because of that. Yeah, well, I have to say, like, there's, there's no, there's no else. real personification of the antagonist. Sure, and that's so, what sort right? of like it's it's horrifying just this, thing about it. It's just this like. Fear of death and yeah. like the specter of death, like looming over him the entire, literally the entire time. Because, <laughs> yep. like I said, he like he gives descriptions of characters that are there to go about his execution to make sure it goes through. And all he ever does is describe their rank, their uniform, yeah. and what weapons they're carrying. Yeah, exactly, because that's like, all he would in- know yeah. about them. Exactly, right? like, they're, they're instruments of the war. Yep. And as much as he's not the narrator, he's the one whose eyes you're seeing this through. Mm-hmm. Sure, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to give it a one. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Same, same. One's all around. All mm-hmm. right. Protagonist 
Farquaad. Mr. Lord, Farquaad. Mr. Farquaad. Lord Farquaad. Lord Ian, it's please Farquaad. tell us about Lord Farquaad. <laughs> I think we've said everything we, that needs to be said about him. Like, he's a very tragic figure. Um, I, I sympathize with him, which I think that at the time would have been even uh, more heresy of some yeah. sorts. And um, I, 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 I don't think there's much more to say about him. I kind of agree with that. I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to give him a one just because you see everything he, through his eyes, and it's very, it's a very is strong vision. The framework, right? like it's a very yeah. strong vision throughout this story, and that's, I mean, that's all you really have to say, other than all the other things yeah. that we've already, yeah, exactly, <laughs> that we've no, already again, got over. I logically, I'll say that he's a vehicle for well, uh, the other things that are happening. So therefore, he has to get enough credit to to be a good vehicle for that stuff. Yeah. Mm. All right. Mr. Scott Thurlow, so, tell us about the supporting characters. So somewhat conversely, I mean, we just mentioned them, the wooden soldiers, the tin soldiers, if you will, because like, that, again, it's not the point. It doesn't need secondary characters, really. Like, whatever ones are there, like even the flashbacks of his family and even like the, the federal scout, if mm-hmm. as we mentioned, they're just there to, in service of the theme, I would say, more or less, like f- for a large part. So while they exist in the story... It, that they're just there to round it all out. They're there to highlight the the the, the more major things that we already talked about. Yeah. So would you say the theme is the secondary character in this? Yeah, and the best wow. one. Like it counts as its own the one. The theme is the theme. Yeah. I'm gonna leave it there. The, but like, yeah, the secondary. But characters you know what I'm this, trying to say. Yeah. I agree. I, I agree with you. And the secondary characters in this are furniture. Yeah. Basically. To the story, they, they serve, and, it, and they are described as such. And, yeah. yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, precisely. Exactly. And I, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't, in good, all good faith, give give supporting yeah. a one, or even though, not er, no uh, er, forget yeah. the er, <laughs> even though, uh, it's not. I think this yeah. is a, I think this is a really well crafted story. I think it's a really well done story. I just don't think that supporting characters are a part of it. Exactly. And we've done that before, so. Nor would their inclusion have helped the story. Yeah, story. Exactly. Right. In fact, it may have hurt it even, yeah. like if they, if they try to like flush them out. Yeah. But again, it's not, it's not per se like a fault of the story, just that it isn't the focus of it. So but therefore. They weren't But necessary. it's still a zero for me yeah. for supporting. Yep. I assume everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. Well, then it's going to be on to me with dialogue. I don't. Really remember much dialogue? I don't think, I don't there, think is there is any. Is there is any dialogue. In wait, this. I'm sorry. See, now we no, 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 no. no wait, wait, it was in to, his head. He talks to the no, no. no. Well, theoretically, perhaps, yeah. but he talks to the soldier <laughs> right briefly, and he talks to his wife briefly. Uh, sure, he says, I'm like, gonna I'm words. gonna say something in style that will deepen the way that I'm talking about this, but sure. I'm not gonna say it right now. Uh, I don't think there is any dialogue really, which means that i mean certainly there is internal monologue dialogue which is fine but it's not it's not overwhelmingly good right it would have to be for me it would have to be overwhelmingly good to get over the fact there's no actual dialogue in the in the story so i'm probably going to go on the weaker side of this unless somebody can convince me i'm not going to convince you but again this is something we've come up against variously right where should we count like (laughs) The monologue, in a, whatever inner monologue there is itself as dialogue. But I think I'm, I'm going to lean on your side in this one that, again, sort of a de facto default zero probably just because, again, it is not the point. It doesn't need dialogue mm-hmm. per se. Right. Maybe this is more of a fault of our system than it is. Well, it is more of a fault of the system <laughs> than it is the story. Yeah. Right. But it is the system. And the system in this case d- determines it gets a zero. The system says zero. <laughs> <laughs> Market zero, dude. Uh, Story doesn't need our system. Any, anything to add, Rich? On that, no. It's just a no, zero. Really yeah. don't All right. Have anything to so, add. Rich, we're gonna go to you with style. I guess I said precast. Like I was, I wasn't initially a fan of the intro or the start of the story. Like, the intro to the story mm. when it started off, but like taking everything into account, I like how it eventually came together. Mm. Yeah. Because, like, it spends a painful amount of time describing everything that he's seeing up until his imminent death in excruciating detail. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, that's kind after, of the point. Yeah. And, like, after you find out that's his dying, his dying vision, dream, vision, or, yeah. vision, dream, what have you, <laughs> and he's trying to take in the last of his life before that rope snaps his neck. Mm-hmm. Like, I very much enjoyed it. 
Like he, especially, uh, especially like his description of his dying dream of how he's like all the sensations of getting away. Like even though he's he gets shot up, he has and the, like the, he, the, yeah. The, the, I really love the end of it. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. like I really love the end of it where he says like he feels the rope tighten and he feels his throat dry out and his mm-hmm. tongue sticks out. Right, like this is yep. things that would actually happen. At the end of a rope, right? And it like this As is they're the end of the second being hanged. Yeah. Yes, sure. That this entire story takes place over, and like that's what I, that's it's what like I the, really it, love. Each of the each of the moment, like every bit that happens, like as he's being hanged, is punctuated in the story mm. at certain points that catch like bring him out of his dying dream for just a half a second. Yeah, yeah. and then he claws his way back <laughs> right. to try to see his wife again before he passes on. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Let me just put this in here before I forget to do it. Um, this entire story takes place over the you know time frame of probably a minute. However long it takes for mm-hmm. someone to suffocate. Right? Like they, they do and, and yeah. most and almost all of that is them like preparing the first part. Yeah. Preparing to hang him. The second part is like this setup and like the or not not necessarily set up, but like the pay uh, payoff of like him getting set up and like going and trying to burn this bridge. But that's I to me that's all in his head, right? Like of course, so was, yes. There, the this entire story is like you know some guys take him out onto a ledge and they leave. Like most of them leave. The last guy takes out the thing from underneath the his foot, plank, the plank yeah. from underneath his foot, and he hangs. Right. That's. A minute, maybe, and like it's it's such a detailed story, and spans such a long time frame in his mind for how short of a story it actually is, which is kind of a genius thing to me, especially since it's very effective. Probably not much like this existed before, if anything. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's a really interesting way to tell a story. Especially for somebody who is who is doing it for the first time and like learning, like on the learning on the job, if you will, yeah. how to tell that story. Sure, you know. So we already mentioned how this is a very innovative work for different stylistic elements, mm-hmm. and for that it gets a one. I just want to make a point of one that I really like. It happens in the first part, and it's actually very effectively done in the Twilight Zone episode, uh, which is he he hears this like banging of a metal. Oh and yeah. It's like, seeping into his brain and mm. it's and it turns out to be the ticking of his watch and he's just so kind of yeah. entranced in that's a very you're right it's, it's a really super effective detail yeah, yeah. so uh, no I agree you're right about that that's a very like that's a perfect sort of microcosm example of the style of the story mm-hmm. to highlight like how effective it is and uh, just again overall that I think the story is like not all style but a lot of it comes from its style because of how innovative it was Right. With using all that and everything we just said. So, yeah, I don't have much more to add. I'm going to give it a very strong one yes. for yeah. everything we well, just discussed. Completely if, agree if with I that. Can, mm-hmm. If I could take away some of these zeros and add <laughs> Put ones them back in style, the style yeah. <laughs> I would, but yeah. I can't. So Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I'm enough. with you. Um, all right. So, we're going to get on to recommendation with Ian. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that if you are listening to a podcast about uh, short stories, <laughs> uh, you should read this. It's... Uh, Considering its age, it's inoffensive in the like the like it's, it doesn't drag on too long. It's a pretty quick read, and it should be read for kind of historical purposes. Yeah. Uh, and that's all I have to say about that. That's pretty much what I would say. Like, yeah, but I mean, uh, as uh, Rich is sort of like the example for if if you've seen anything like it, this is the reason why. Yeah. So that's why I would definitely recommend it. And if it's been a while, like I believe I read the story once in my life many years ago. I remember the Twilight Zone episode a lot more, but again, without the story, that would not exist. And nor would so many other things that had used the same thing to varying degrees. But without an innovator, you cannot, you know, expand or attempt to homage it and f- fall flat. Either way, I highly recommend the story. It is an important story. Uh, just in gen- narrative in general. Right. Rich? I'd have to completely agree. I kind of, I'm really glad you guys <laughs> recommended this one to me. <laughs> think, yeah. of it, think of it as homework, if you will, but yeah. in the best way. 
it's it's something that I, I had. This is the first time that I had read this story somehow. Um, it's a classic short story. If you are into literature, you've probably at least heard about this. Mm. And if you haven't read it yet and you're into literature, read it. It's a it's a good short story. It's a well crafted short story, and it is the reason that a lot of other yes. <laughs> things exist. Like it's 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 kind of the precursor to a lot no, of other like you said stories, short or not, movie, you know, TV, video game, whatever, what have you, literature, what what have you. It is the as as Scott loves to say, and I think we mentioned earlier, it's the ur example. Of a lot of these types of things. I actually, like your description, it is the roots of so many other yeah. stories that you got to give it credit and definitely check it out. Absolutely. It. So I think that's strong ones in all of those. Mm-hmm. I'm going to throw it over to Ian, mm-hmm. and I believe it's going to be an easy one again. It is. Uh, we all give it eights or an eight overall. Yep. Yeah, and and I think that's a I and think, that's a, that's a fault I think of eight our is scale. a good score. Perhaps Not the it fault might be even slightly story, better than yeah. that um, in my mind, but but I think an eight is a is a pretty solid idea of what this is. I think it is. We didn't give it zeros really on any fault of its own. We gave it zeros because our scale yeah. made us give zeros. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be it for uh, an occurrence on Owl Creek Bridge. Uh, I have been Steve Armosi here with Rich Perry. Good night. Ian Manzer. A figment in someone else's dying dream. And uh, Scott Thurlow. Good thing you looked at your uh, <laughs> your notebook there. I was going to say, uh, off to have my own dying dream. Good night. See you next time. <laughs> have a good night. Lots to do about nothing. Lots to do about nothing. Music by Chris Morgan. Editing and engineering by Jonathan Ian Manzer. Lots to do about nothing. This has been a Lawson's production. All rights reserved. <laughs>